welcome to all those joining us on Zoom and those who are finding us on our website or YouTube channel. We're so glad to have you with us here today. We will be sharing in Holy Communion together, so please have your bread, wine, or juice ready for later in the service. Next week, we will be worshiping in small communities. If you would like to join a small community, please let us know, and we would be happy to connect you. On May 16th, we're back on all Zoom church, and then on May 23rd, Pentecost, We'll be honoring our graduates in a lawn chair worship service at LCP. We will also have Zoom open for all of us, all of those that cannot join us in person. Now, as we come to this time of worship in our living rooms, our kitchen tables, and transforming them into sanctuaries of God's presence, I invite you to take a few deep breaths and settle our hearts and mind on worship. Please pray with me. Lord of all, in Jesus, you have made us all sisters and brothers in Christ. There is no distinction between Gentile and Jew. There is no separation that can remove any from fellowship in Christ's community. Help us appreciate our many differences and help us to seek unity so that we may proclaim your truth to all for the sake of Jesus Christ in whom there is harmony and peace. Amen. I invite you to join in on the Kyrie. and steadfast love of God, let us take a moment to confess our sin now in the presence of God and one another. Let us just pause for a moment that we can on our own individually lay our hearts before God, and then we will confess together. Merciful God, you sent your son Jesus to save the lost. We confess that we are often lost. We stray from you and turn aside from your way. We fail in love, neglect justice, and ignore your truth. For the wrong we have done, for the good we have failed to do. Have mercy on us and create in us clean hearts that seek you with all of our strength. Shape us into brave followers of Jesus who love and serve as you do. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now with joyful and forgiven hearts, let us sing our hymn.
morning. Today's reading is from Acts 15 verses 1 through 18. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching their brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem and discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church and as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders and they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary for them to be circumcised in order to keep the law, in order to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met, met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, my brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear. On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence, listening to Barnabas and Paul, as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, my brothers, listen to me. Simon has related how God first looked favorably upon the Gentiles to take them among, to take from among a people for his name. This agrees with the word of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen. From its ruins, I will rebuild it. I will set it up so that all the other peoples may seek the Lord, even all Gentiles, over whom my name has been called. Thus said the Lord, who made, who had been making these things known from long ago. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Good morning. Welcome to children's time. I have to say, I miss game night with my friends. We used to get together pretty much on a weekly basis, sometimes every other week, but I miss game nights. One thing about game nights is there's rules to games. Some games, pretty simple rules and you don't even need the directions. Uh, the game of operation, you grab a card and that's the piece you try to pull out. If you hit the little metal buzzer, you lose your turn. If you get it out, you get money, easy. There are some games that everybody knows the rules. The game of Monopoly. When you draw a card that says go to jail, what's the rule? Do not pass go, do not collect $200. And then there's some games that are a little bit more tricky. A favorite of my friends was dominoes. Uh, and we learned early on that we all played differently as kids growing up with our families. So we all had different rules to the game. Uh, and I don't think any of them were the actual game rules with the set of dominoes. So we had to learn early on to set rules that we all agreed on at the beginning of the game. And that's kind of what we have followed because early on it led to some disagreements. That's kind of like in debate. Two people are arguing or debating two different sides of a topic, but they do come together on the rules of debate at the beginning of the match. That's kind of like what was happening in this story. You have people coming from different backgrounds, different traditions, and they needed to settle on what was going to be the way going forward. The thing is, the way going forward was their belief in God and their belief in Jesus. Let's pray. 
Dear God, we know that sometimes we may not always agree with people, and that's okay. Even people that have the same faith and the same upbringing as we do, we may not always get along. What we have to remember is that as long as we have your love and guidance, that is how we will move forward. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Holy God, thank you for community. Thank you for technology. And thank you for your word for us. Thank you that we are able to worship together. Thank you that we are a community that can take a pause when we need to. And thank you for the miracle of making the music come together finally this morning. God, help us to pause now to hear what it is that you want to speak into our hearts as individuals, as a community of faith, and as people who are your hands and feet and heart and voice in any place that we occupy in the world on a daily basis. Amen. So last week we held up our value of radical hospitality to the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch that ends with Philip baptizing the eunuch in this random bit of water that they're passing by. And after sharing the good news of Jesus with him, right, that eunuch just wants immediately to be part of God's family and God's kingdom. It's this incredible story of daring to witness to your faith, a curiosity about another human that makes them feel welcomed and valued, and a willingness to jump in when the Holy Spirit moves. And it, it just completely expands our picture of what could be radical about the hospitality that we share with those around us when we bring a scriptural hospitality into our encounters with people, especially those who are outside the walls of our church building and our faith community. Well, today we are holding up the value of bold innovation to a story that's quite a bit further into the book of Acts, but that in a lot of ways follows up on the story of Philip and the eunuch. Between that moment and the moment we are in today, Saul, who oversaw the stoning of Stephen, was on a rampage to round up all the Christians and throw them into prison and had many of them killed. Well, he has had this encounter with Jesus, and that turns his life on its head. And instead of persecuting Christians now, he's quickly becoming the greatest evangelist that ever lived. Witnessing to Jesus in a way that has people all over the known world coming to believe in and follow him. And remember that his persecution of the people that called themselves followers of the way led to them being scattered in all directions. And between that scattering and Paul's incredible teaching and preaching, the church had not only moved outside the walls of the church, so to speak, because it wasn't even really called a church yet, but it had knocked those walls completely down. And this explosion of growth outward into regions beyond Jerusalem and Judea, beyond the bounds of Judaism, it led to a deep internal conflict in that community of faith. And that is the story that we have in front of us today. The covenant that God made with Israel was marked with the sign of circumcision and the responsibility that was given in that covenant was to follow the Torah, the law of Moses. This was how this community identified itself. This was their tradition, their way of being God followers in the world. And even though this group of Jews was now following Jesus, they still held to their Jewish roots. And so anyone wanting to join them also, they believe, needed to follow this tradition, to be like them, to become like them as they found their way into the community. And I want to point out here that these leaders of the faith had a deep, deep desire to welcome in these non-Jewish Jesus believers the Gentiles who had come to believe in Jesus, but the way they've always done things was coming into sharp conflict with that desire. I think we know something of this conflict in our own hearts today. 
the Holy Spirit was doing a new thing in the lives of these Gentiles, and it was calling into question their traditions and their habits of faith. They were being called upon to innovate, to adapt, to change, and that's hard. It's upsetting. It's painful. It led them to a way of being church that looked quite a bit different from the way they had been church for centuries but it also made room for others to encounter Jesus, the risen Christ, and to change thousands of lives. Now, the best in a definition of innovation I've ever heard um, came from Terry Elton, who was our intern last summer. This definition says innovation is a new way of doing something that leads to the adoption of a new practice by a community that over time creates a new mindset or way of seeing the world. It's not doing something new just for the sake of doing something new or, or finding the shiny gimmick, right? That will get people in the door of our company, our organization, our church. It's a new way of doing something that leads to new ways of being new ways of seeing and relating to the world around you. That's a much deeper change. We've been the church the way we are for over 500 years now. During the Reformation, the church went through a great innovation that brought Jesus to many in a new and deeper way. Martin Luther made radical changes to the deep traditions of the church. He translated the Bible into the language of the people so that we could read it and understand it for ourselves, come to our own questions and wonderings and answers. He gave the sermon a central place in worship and even raised up the preacher, right, created the first pulpit so that people could see and hear better. It wasn't always that way. He wrote the small catechism actually as a poster to hang in kitchens so that people could teach their children and continue to learn themselves about the key elements of faith around the kitchen table. He stripped the sanctuaries of excessive decoration so that people could focus on the beauty of God's word and God's promises and not on earthly beauty. Before Martin Luther, worship was different. Faith was lived out differently. Even the life and role of the pastor was different. Luther came along as well as others, and they innovated toward the movement of the Holy Spirit in order to more completely fulfill the mission of the church, which is to draw people, always all people, to God. And today, again, the church is undergoing a reformation. Right? The pandemic has given us a pause as we've been forced to worship and gather differently, it's left us wondering about the shape the church will take when the worst of the pandemic is behind us. The incredible social inequity against our black and brown siblings that have been in the spotlight have also given us pause. They've been this mirror, not only to our policing and our economics, but also to our language to the possible biases that we might have in the church. How might the Holy Spirit be moving in these pauses to reform the church once again? At Lutheran Church of Peace, we describe our value of bold innovation like this. Building on our rich history, we explore new ways of being the church without of the box thinking. Being willing to move beyond the way things have always been done, we embrace new ideas and the many cultures of our community. How are we being called to innovate today in ways that will lead us to new ways of being church, new ways of seeing and relating to the world around us that will help us fulfill our mission of drawing more and more people to God? Peter and Paul were in one of these moments as Paul and Barnabas came before the council of elders to wonder about this question, about how the Gentiles came to be part of the church. 
And their discernment gives us some steps that we can't overlook as we discern for ourselves the path forward. And the very first thing to note is that Paul and Barnabas and some of the believers with him, right, they leave where they are and they, they go and they have this conversation with Peter and the other leaders of the church. They don't decide on their own. This decision isn't made in some back room. It isn't one person's interpretation of scripture or experience or their agenda, their personal take or their way of wanting to do things, right? They go through this discernment. They make this decision together in community. They hold each other accountable to listen beyond their own personal motivations and biases to the place where God is calling them. This is hard work, but we do it together. Then they listen deeply to one another, and we know something about how to do this. Paul and Barnabas shared stories of how the Spirit was moving in their ministry, how the Gentiles were receiving the Holy Spirit without being circumcised first. They were seeing God do a new thing through the church, and they called others to pay attention to that movement. Where is the Holy Spirit moving today? What is our role in the holy movements happening toward creation care and racial justice and church growth and vitality? I believe that we will know when we pay attention to what the Holy Spirit is doing in our world and we honor that work and we seek to participate in that holy activity. And finally, James looked to scripture to understand how the current call they felt to include Gentiles was in fact faithful to the word of God throughout history. This biblical and theological interpretation, that is important work in this discernment. We know people have quoted scripture throughout history to justify all kinds of evils. Slavery and its continuing legacy of racism, oppression of women, violence towards LGBTQIA people, and BIPOC communities. Part of our work as the church against those evils in the world is our continued witness to the message of love and inclusion and freedom in Jesus Christ. How does that message lead us to new ways of being in the world today as faithful followers of that same Jesus? At LCP, we are digging into our values during this Easter season because Easter is a season of new life. And as the ways we gather and learn and worship are different due to COVID, and as the social upheaval in our country right now is a mirror for all of us, it seems a good time to also consider what really makes us the church. Are we listening to each other's stories? Are we seeking out stories beyond the faith community? And based on the wisdom of those stories and the truth of scripture and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, what does our worship look like going forward? What does our church activity look like? These are good and hard questions right now, but they're faithful and they are the work of the church right now for this moment. And I know that LCP is up to the task. I want to close by offering a blessing by an author, Jan Richardson. It is a blessing for courage. And it holds a lot of the emotions of this time. This time when we are moving toward the other side of pandemic, and yet we're not there, frustratingly so. This time after Derek Chauvin's trial, having gotten through this without riots and looting in the streets again, thankfully, and yet also not in a complete place of change. In this time when the stage of grief seems often on the edge of a long held anger, have you noticed that people are a little more on edge lately? I've had some friends naming that and we've wondered about that stage of grief and where we are at, all of us with our anxiety and our grief up to about here, makes it so much easier for things to spill over. And it makes it easier 
to be right on the edge of wanting a deep, that deep-seated desire to rush back to the way things were and just forget that this all ever happened. And so I think in this time, we need courage. So here's Jan's blessing. When the light around you lessens and your thoughts darken until your body feels fear turn cold as a stone inside, when you find yourself bereft of any belief in yourself and all you unknowingly leaned on has fallen, when one voice commands your whole heart and it is raven dark, steady yourself and see that it is your own thinking that darkens your world. Search and you will find a diamond thought of light. Know that you are not alone and that this darkness has purpose. Gradually, it will school your eyes to find the one gift your life requires hidden within this night corner. Invoke the learning of every suffering you have suffered. Close your eyes. Gather all the kindling about your heart to create one spark. That is all you need to nourish the flame that will cleanse the dark of its weight of fested fear. A new confidence will come alive to urge you toward higher ground where your imagination will learn to engage difficulty in its most rewarding threshold. The hard piece of this moment is that we're called out and up, not back and in. The joy of this moment is that we are in the purpose and the swirl and the imagination of the Holy Spirit. Good news for us, the leaders of the church in Peter and Paul's time decided for inclusion, and they shifted away from some deep traditions and ways of being and creating and identifying themselves as church, that we might know the goodness and grace of God in Jesus. As we listen and discern and pray and innovate together, we extend that good news outward once again. So let us be of good courage. Amen. I can just see, I can just see and wait for your goodness. Hope to feel your presence. I can just stay. I could just stay right where I am and hope to feel you, hope to feel something again. I could hold on, I could hold on to who I am and never let you change me from the I could be safe, oh, I could be safe here in your arms and never leave home, never let his walls down, but you have called me higher, you have called me deeper, and I'll go where you will leave me home. You have called me higher, you have called me deeper, and I'll go Like the path before me, 
Now let us gather around God's table of grace and goodness. Let us pray for God's church and the world and all those in need. Please join me. Holy God, we give you thanks that you are a God that is always innovating, always leading us forward, always leading us toward one another in new and deeper ways. God, these days of COVID and social unrest and inequity have been some of the hardest in our country and in our lives, at least as we have known them. And the wrestling in our own hearts and in our community of faith are deep. And the grief over what we haven't been able to do and on days like this when technology is failing us, we lament that we aren't together the way we have been. We lament that the things are not the way they were, not the way they are supposed to be, not the way we want them to be. Lord, that grief is deep in us through a year of pivoting and pivoting and pivoting again. And that grief at times just sort of wells over in frustration, in anxiety. And so we just come before you, Lord, today with all of that emotion, all that wondering. And we're so grateful that you are a God that hears all of that, that knows all of that, that grief and that frustration, even when we don't have words for it, Lord, you are a God that hears the unspoken, deepest corners of our hearts. And you are there in those spaces with us, tending to them. So we put them before you for healing, for comfort, Fill our hearts now with your presence and with your Holy Spirit. Might that spirit swirl in us, stir in us a strong desire to be your hearts and your hands and your feet and your voice in the world that all might come to know your grace and your goodness. Give us that courage, Lord, to step across the threshold, to step out, to step up, Lead us ever higher into new ways of being your church in the world. God, we pray for our nation's leaders, our state and our local leaders as they too wrestle with how we put our society together in these days to how we walk in the deep divide between peoples. Might justice and equity and peace, rule their hearts, give them wisdom and discernment as they make decisions and put into place new laws that will guard and govern. God, be with those who care 
for creation and who are always looking for new ways for us to, to be in this world that will tend to this beautiful world that you have gifted us with. Lord, as, as the world comes to new life, might we also come to deeper ways of caring for this gift. God, we pray for those in our hearts that we name before you now who are struggling in body, mind, and spirit, whether it be with grief or addiction, loss of purpose, doubt, depression, anxiety, Lord, chronic illness, facing surgery, recovering from surgery, being far away from loved ones who are struggling. Lord, in all the ways that we hurt, lay your healing hands upon us. Make our loved ones, our families, our community, and our world whole. Draw us ever closer to your heart, Lord. As we gather now at your table, fill us with your life and send us from this time that we might be hospitable, bold witnesses to your love and grace. In your son's name we pray, amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now gathered as we are by the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus teaches us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, uh, in lieu of having the, the Lamb of God um, sung for us, let us just take a moment of quiet pause uh, to share the body of Christ with these words, the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. The sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Have a wonderful day if you're not able to stay for coffee.